Switzerland, we launched a vegan tuna. In Have you tasted it? How does it taste like? It tastes like tuna. You will not believe not it. Not like cat or dog food. It's impressive. You would not be able to spot it is not tuna. So, Welcome on Hey China. I'm here in Warsaw, Poland. At the moment, we have the second lockdown. Everything is closed. I'm stuck in my hotel room. China seems to be much better off when it comes to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Things are more or less back to normal, if we can ever say that again. What has the impact of the coronavirus been on Nestle's operation in the country? Look, I think, as everybody, it came out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, it was... I would say a shock to the system. Uh, I think what really shows, and this is the amazing thing about China, that the country and our team and everybody has reacted. And suddenly, uh, you know, it became reality. I remember the first crisis calls that we had, you know, talking to the market, which was mid-January. But really, uh, within, I would say, not even days, within hours, the entire country was mobilized. And so, of course, our organization to put in place the right measures, you know, wearing masks. Uh, and, and I really think, you know, it was an, you know, a crisis that certainly still continues. But I think in the early hours, at the beginning of the crisis, when the pandemic started, it was really, you know, an amazing effort of the team to, first of all, make sure that everybody is safe. And that was the number one priority for us as an organization. How can we ensure that our people are safe wherever they are? The second thing then, of course, is how can we continue to run the business? And if you sell food products, yes, it's a business for us, but let's not forget, people need to eat. And I think when you have such a crisis, food becomes something much more, uh, I would say, important because suddenly it's not, no longer a luxury to have something nice and a treat. Well, you know, you need to make sure that people have enough on their plate to, to eat. And that was the second one. And the third one, of course, then seeing how can we support, uh, you know, the community? How can we give a helping hand to the community in such a situation? So I would say this was really implemented extremely fast. And the interesting thing is it started in China. And then, of course, over the months to come, as you said, you are now in Poland. I'm sitting in, in uh, Germany uh, in my house. I think the whole world learned from how China did it. And also a lot of our other parts of the world actually reached out to us and said, hey, guys, can you tell us what did Nestle China do? We need to learn because we're going to go into the same thing. And that was also an interesting one that I think the whole world looked at China and within the company at Nestle China, how to prepare and what can be done. Bernie, you have over 50,000 people in China. This is quite a labor intensive business. There has been a lot of calls for moving global companies out of China, primarily uh, American companies, but I'm sure in Europe by and large, you know, how do you see the situation? What is Nestle's stance on it? For us, I think it's important that, as you said, it's a big business. Uh, we have 50,000 people in China for us with a revenue of around six and a half billion dollars or Swiss francs. China is the second largest market for the Nestle group. So for us, it's an important, it's a big business. But I think what's really uh, important to mention is we are in China for China. So over 90%, I would say 95% of the products we sell, we do manufacture in China. We have 30 factories. And basically for us, China is a domestic market where we want to win and succeed with local consumers. And for us, it is neither an export hub where we take products, manufacture and send it to the rest of the world, nor an import hub where we sell goods coming out of Switzerland or somewhere else and then sell it to the consumer. So for us, I think we you know, see uh, and continue to see the huge potential of the market. Uh, it's a 1.3 billion population that uh, has got, gone through the, I would say, most successful transformation human mankind coming from being one of the poorest countries in the world to being one of the most sophisticated. So we see huge potential in the market. And for us, really, it is about being in China and succeeding in China with Chinese consumers uh, and our local operations. Nestle has traditionally focused on three core pillars, which is nutrition, health and wellness. Now it's launching a lot of new exciting products uh, such as uh, plant-based milk, vegan burgers around the world, but also this uh, trend is starting now in China. What kind of new vegan and uh, plant-based meat products and so on, what kind of new exotic uh, food are you planning to launch in China? 
Well, I think it's, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because this has been a global trend that people are looking for healthier products. And I think really that's, that's why important. It is not that I would say some companies, us and others, have this idea, let's push this to the consumers. It's something that comes from the consumers. And I would say that the reason why people especially want to eat more plant-based, I would say comes from, you have three main drivers for that. One is health. And a lot of people um, assume that eating plant-based is actually healthier for you than um, you have a heavy a meat diet. The second point is sustainability. A lot of people say we will not be able to feed the world's population by having uh, relying solely on animal protein. And the third one is, in many countries, that's a bit more local, is animal cruelty. So people say, look, the way how animals, you know, it's an industry and this is not right and we want to do something. So it is really something that comes from the consumer. That's why this plant-based is, is happening around the world and also in China. I think China is a bit different than other parts of the world. In China, plant-based or vegetarian has always been part of, of the food. Yes, you eat meat, but you also had, I still believe, some of the most tasty vegetarian dishes without calling it out being purely vegetarian. But the clearly, Buddhist uh, restaurants have been some of the best in China for sure. But just coming back on the uh, consumer demand and Nestle's uh, reaction, should a food giant like Nestle not also be more proactive when it comes to sustainability? Is it not the responsibility of such a big multinational to also drive the debate when it comes to climate change and healthy nutrition and so on? Absolutely. Fully agree. You're 100% right. I think that there is an obligation to do that. I think it's something that uh, we have been doing for a long time, but I think you know, the way how we used to talk about it was more, I would say, too technical. For a long time, and maybe you've seen, we have this thing called creating shared value, which is basically Nestle's own uh, social responsibility initiative that we had a long time ago that was initiated by our previous chairman and CEO, Peter Brabeck, and then always continued. But I would say in the last few years, we have really stepped up. A year ago, for example, we announced, we made, I would say, made two big announcements in that regard. One is about... Uh, we made a pledge to be 100% carbon uh, neutral by uh, 2050. Uh, and the other one is also in regards of recyclability. So by 2025, all our uh, packaging materials and everything will be either reusable or recyclable. And so, yes, we are stepping up. Um, and I think you do this for two reasons. One, you do it because uh, your consumers want it. And I think, you know, just being there and doing business is no longer good enough. And the second point is, I think also as a company, as you rightly say, and as a big company, we have an obligation to lead in that area and to work uh, with the local uh, societies, with our suppliers, with our customers, and really help in this step change. This is extremely important, and that's what we have, we have uh, started to do, and we do it also in, in China. How do you see the competition rising inside the China market for Nestle? Ah, look, China is the most competitive market in the world. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that for, for a, a number of reasons. For me, it's the most competitive because you have all the international companies there. You have some regional companies, but you have so many strong national players that are extremely good. And, you know, I think they are big, so they have scale. They are extremely fast when they want to do something. And they're innovative. And this is what I think really has, you know, has transformed China in many industries, including food, over the last 10 years, that it has come from, I would say, a society and a business world that was maybe more following trends to now setting trends. And we see this, of course, in you know, the whole digital e-commerce space where China, I would say, is leading the world, but we also see it in food, where a lot of local companies are actually extremely fast and innovative. Can you give us some uh, examples of local strong competitors for Nestle, please? Sure. Uh, look, you have some of the very big ones that everybody is familiar with, for example, Mengyu and Yili, the dairy champions, uh, who I think do amazing work in, in, in their field. But let me pick somebody, another one. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's a coffee company called Saturn Bird. It's a small company that started three, four years ago, and they sell single-serve coffee, uh, soluble coffee, in small packed uh, 
units, you can call it capsule for one use, money has come from nowhere to being a few hundred million RMB in sales, but really setting new trends. And this is, I think, a great example that, you know, you see innovation going way beyond the product. It's the whole model, how you package the product, how you engage with your consumers. So that's, that's a new, smaller competitor that maybe, you know, in the global scale, people don't talk about, but it's, it's, it's nice to see that these things on. And of course, it, it keeps us honest. And you know, when you look at, I mean, one of our biggest brands, Nescafe, I've just had a coffee here. Uh, we now start to sell some very different products going in the same way because we need to, you know, keep up with, with them and, and uh, do the same. One of the strategies of Nestle that you were in charge of as well has been to partner up with local companies and the partnerships and so on. Are you planning to continue with that strategy? to team up with local players? No, absolutely, uh, Martina. I think it's a great question. We started uh, 20 years ago with our first uh, joint venture, our partnership with a company in Shanghai called Tai Tele, which is a, a chicken bouillon business founded by a local entrepreneur. And for a long time, we had a partnership. We on 80%, he on 20 Then we did a few other deals with Shu Fuji, which is a confectionery business where we still have our local partners. And also uh, uh, Yinlu, which is a peanut and uh, milk and congee business. So yes, we partner with local uh, companies when we think they can bring something to the business that we don't have or we can't develop ourselves. We have also successfully launched our own businesses in China. And maybe a very interesting, only recently we have announced an investment with a, a venture capital fund in China with Tiantu, which is a very well known and um, I think very successful uh, VC fund that has over the last few years uh, done some super interesting investments include in, in the consumer space, including companies like uh, Three Squirrels and others. And so now we are a, a partner in this fund. And the idea really is to learn because of course, as a VC company, you are at the pulse of, you know, new businesses entering the market, what new consumers want. And that's a really interesting new way of, of, of uh, working. So. Uh, Long answer, I think partnering is even more important in today's world because you can't do everything yourself. You need to pick, and I think you need to pick a large network of partners, and that's when you're going to be successful. Ernie, talking about uh, adaptation to local tastes, so tell us uh, what are the new products, new innovations you have developed specifically for the Chinese market? Oh, we, I hope we have enough time talking about that. There's quite a few. Uh, let's start maybe with our biggest uh, category that we have in China, which is infant nutrition. So in infant nutrition, um, we have two brands. We have on one hand our Nestle business, uh, and uh, then we have uh, YF Infant Nutrition. And I think YF is a great example that there's a brand that today sells uh, way over $1 billion, um, and which is solely uh, in China, which is called Iluma, which is a super premium infant nutrition uh, formula in in China that was developed by a local team in China for Chinese consumers, identifying a need of a super premium formula for specifically nutritionally uh, special for a Chinese baby. So that's, that's one example of something that uh, the baby food side Gerber, which has been a long uh, and big brand in the US, and I'm sure you're familiar with that, uh, Gerber uh, baby food. But now we have uh, just recently invested in a um, factory up in Heilongjiang, to also develop local products uh, under the Gerber range for Chinese mothers and Chinese uh, babies. So that's an example. I mentioned coffee where we do quite a, a lot of uh, activities now or a small business for us, which is extremely exciting is ice cream. Ice cream is not the biggest business, but we have a very big business in South of China and the North in Beijing. And they are really, lately we came up with some amazing new flavors and, you know, very unusual uh, that would be combining, you know, something for a European, you would, why would you mix those two flavors? But it really resonates with young Chinese consumers. So it's a game of constant innovation and renovation because if you don't follow that game and you constantly upgrade your portfolio, you will be outdated by expectations and brand loyalty is much lower than in other parts of the world. So if you don't stay relevant, they would replace you extremely fast. Mm. Food safety, Bernie, has been a key issue and concern for people around the world, but especially for the Chinese consumers. You've spent five years in the country in uh, Nestle's headquarters in Beijing from 2012 to 2000. 
and 17 have, and have seen the development of food safety standards as well, baby milk, uh, formulas, candles, and so on. So what kind of improvement have you witnessed, maybe especially thanks to new innovations and also big data? Look, I think the situation has improved tremendously over the last few years. And food safety is still, I would say, in, you know, despite all the innovation, everything we talked about, the most important thing is that you can offer the consumer a safe product. And this is what we and all our competitors, I assume, do, this, um, and do the same is focusing on that. But I would say in the last few years, as you said, big data made a huge, huge difference because suddenly traceability is becoming much easier. So when before you had to find very complicated ways of, you know, physical supply chain controls, now with, you know, for example, QR codes or with blockchain initiatives, you can really trace that. So some of our infant formulas, they have unique uh, QR codes and then blockchain. And a mother can really trace the entire movement of this tin of infant formula from the factory, how it was shipped, where it went to. And I think this really gives a lot of, trust to the consumers and this is an interesting thing because you remember also at time consumers in china prefer to buy imported products and i think the reason for that was because they trusted them more than the local products but luckily i think it's really changing and i mean really i think this is one for me of the the greatest things that could happen in, in china that chinese consumers no longer have this association imported is good and safe local not so sure no now they can trust local products as much as imported products because there are ways that they can be assured these products have been produced in the right way, have been kept in the right way and uh, sold in the right way. So I think that that really has changed. But clearly food safety will always remain important for um, a company like us, but clearly also for the government. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot of uh, continuous efforts to make this even stronger in the future. Nestle just invested $100 million in China in May. In the midst of uh, COVID-19, what did you invest in? Ah, look, I think that, you know, it's a bit what I said earlier, the potential of this market for us is, is huge. And I know it, for some people it's hard to imagine that today, but COVID will be over one day. And I am very positive that we're going to see it. And talking to my colleagues in China, which I do every day, that the impact locally is now very, very small. So therefore investing is just what we would have done without COVID. We need to invest to ensure we can uh, continue to uh, supply to consumers. So as you said, we made this investment uh, in Tianjin, where we invested basically in um, three big, uh, three big um, areas. One is uh, for um, pet care, which is a booming category. And you see pet ownership in China going up. It's, for us, a, a very nicely uh, developing business. Um, so we expand and build a new uh, plant for specific products for Chinese pet owners. Then we've also invested in uh, these plant-based products that Martina uh, mentioned before. So soon we will start to sell uh, plant-based burgers, but also Chinese products in, that are plant-based. And then also we have upgraded our existing confectionery businesses there. So for us, investing, I think in China has not by any means been impacted by COVID and COVID has not had any impact on our thinking to invest in China. Let's talk about another spicy topic, which is acquisitions. Now, the CFO of Nestle, um, Roger, he recently said that uh, there will be more big acquisitions coming for the uh, company. Tell us a little bit about what we can expect uh, in the pipeline for China. Are you planning any more acquisitions uh, towards the end of this year or 2021? Look, Martina, you know how, you know how uh, we, we talk about acquisitions and we never comment on a specific project. I think acquisitions, and this is also what, what, what uh, our global CFO said, acquisitions have always been part of this company. And when you look at Nestle, we are basically a patchwork of companies that we have bought. A few things we have launched like Nescafe and Nespresso, but many other brands like Maggie, uh, Kit Kat, they have been acquired over the years. So look, it will continue to play a role. I would say, you know, for China, it's not always about the mega big acquisitions. And we have done some in the past with Shufuji, with Yinlu, but I really think sometimes it is about identifying the right partners you can work with who then help you, uh, you know, to, to do something that maybe internally we can't do. So it's not always about size because we are already quite big. 
It's maybe about you know new ideas, new uh, know-how that we might not have. It's not about it's about making smart acquisitions, not necessarily big acquisitions. Bernie, you just mentioned that uh, if consumers are not very loyal to the brand and you are not as competitive as indigenous competitors, uh, hypothetically, so for understanding Chinese consumer taste, then how competitive are you? Where is your competitive edge? Well, I think the brand Chuchao, our bird's nest brand, is very competitive in China. And, you know, we see it in, uh, in a vast range of uh, products that the consumer buys Chiu Chow. So when, for example, what, what we have Nescafe in the rest of the world, in China, it's Chiu Chow Cafe, where the consumers relate to the bird's nest. Not all our products carry the bird's nest um, product, but the brand itself, and you know, it has been by also uh, quite recently by, uh, by one, one of the big agencies ranked uh, and, and voted as one of the, the big brands. So I think it, it plays a role. When I'm saying loyalty, I think consumers just move much faster to a a big brand like Chichao, we need to uh, ensure that we are offering the products that are relevant. And we cannot rest on, you know, success from the past. That wouldn't work. Uh, digital, I think we do a lot. We work, of course, with all the big platforms. We have done a lot internally to really make us as a company much more digital across the entire value chain, which starts with manufacturing, the whole supply chain area. But then really being able to connect with consumers to do, you know, kind of precision targeting uh, to make sure that you reach those consumers that are the relevant ones for you. It's interesting, uh, in the food, traditional food industry, we do not necessarily think that R&D is a major component of it. Uh, how much does R&D represent in Nestle's uh, corporate earnings today? Uh, look, we invest around $2 billion every year in our R&D uh, network globally, where if you're in Switzerland, but also in China, we have a number of R&D centers in Beijing and then also in other parts of the country where we work on innovation for Chinese consumers. And I think this is important because you need to have this proximity to the market to understand what consumers really want. So for us, innovation is important. And I think what's important is this R&D is really also about being transactionable. Yes, some things are long term for the future where we make big uh, futuristic uh, ground research, but the ones in the market, we really want to be able to offer products in a fast way. In the past, maybe as a big multinational, we were a bit slower, but lately we have really been able to, you know, step up and launch products extremely fast. We have some examples in China where we launched, you know, a new sub coffee brand within uh, literally a few months and went out to the market. Or I give you one example in, uh, in Switzerland, we launched a vegan tuna and this was from idea to on shelf with one of the big retailers in Switzerland. In Have you tasted it? How does it taste like? It tastes like tuna. You will not believe not it. Not like cat or dog food. No, Martina, it's impressive. If you eat a tuna sandwich made with the vuna, as we call it, you would not be able to spot it is not uh tuna so but all of a sudden the world is going to have an access of tuna and salmon and perhaps beef i mean the world's ecological evolution has been balanced by itself over millennia and all of a sudden who's going to consume all of those uh animal proteins i personally believe you will continue we will see a, a continued you know consumption of animal proteins no doubt about that but i think over the last few years you know this, the demand, especially for, for uh, meat, has increased dramatically. And this is really where I think the importance is. It's not only about eating uh, from the health side, but really sustainability. It is going to be very, very complicated to feed the world purely based on, on animal meat. So, uh, because you need a lot of water, there's a lot of CO2 emissions. And I think that's where this plays a role. But I personally believe you will never, ever uh, see this completely going from one side to the other. And if you ask me what I'm, and I'm saying this always also, I still believe personally a balanced diet is the best diet you can have. How many food products we have on our kitchen table are from Nestle. You mentioned Kit Kat and Nescafe. You're drinking it uh, all the time. So which is the Nestle product of the future? Do you think it is still probably Nescafe, the best seller or which one could it be? It, I, I'm not sure about this one yet, but I think you will see, you know, coffee remaining one of the most important products for us. 
but it's changing and you know maybe uh you will see it consumed or prepared in a different way of course you know we have nespresso the, the, mach the machine systems with nespresso but i think coffee will always remain a very important one i think that uh the heart of our company is nutrition and i also believe that the whole area of infant nutrition will always remain extremely important there's many other categories. One area that is relatively new to us is this part that we call Nestle Health Science. And that's an area where also the, the quote uh, from our CFO was about acquisitions, where we have recently bought an, a company in the US. Uh, and this is an area where I believe we will see a lot in the future. And this goes into the field of personalized nutrition. A technology, you're much better positioned to really offer personalized uh, products to consumers. So I think that will be an interesting development if you not think one or two years ahead, but 10 or 20 years ahead. We will see much more in that space. Bernie, China is the second largest market in the world for Nestle. What would it take for China to be the largest? What's your plan there? Well, first of all, I hope one day we will be. Um, the US is the biggest market today, but uh, I think it's, it's, and it's, it's a distant number two in that regard. But I think it's really continuing to develop our portfolio we have today that will give us good growth. And, you know, if I look purely at the economic development of China, that should already, uh, you know, be a, a good boost. But then I think, yes, continuing to look, you know, how can we maybe invest in some ourselves or externally in some of these new fast growing uh, segments that are merging in the market and coming up. And that's, as I said, when we look at our investment fund, that's one way to do it. Uh, we partner with, you know, universities to be on the R&D side. Uh, but I think that, you know, it's really going to be important to do more local products uh, in, in the future. Mm -hmm.